Well, hello, boys and girls. It's when we feel like it's o'clock, and we got a whole lot of wees here today. Yes. Well, we, we're going to be, the, you know who I am, Pearl of Wisdom. This is Joe Bork. I did, do I need to tell you, Deli? Like, shouldn't by now. Everybody in the land knows who they are. If they don't, you got to go find out. And we'll tell you at the end of this video where you can find them because they are awesome. Well, we have some great stuff to discuss to, now. Uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs have been absolutely fantastic. Having midday games and all this stuff, it's been insane. Um, some great series going on right now. You know, Joe, Bo Joe Bork and I, we are Philadelphia fans. We're going to talk about some of the the crazy stuff that's been going on in that series we're going to do a little bit about the vancouver canucks but uh and the st louis series because that has been some kind of entertaining um but first let's get to uh we, we didn't really talk too much about it let's talk about the boston situation and uh deli you really wanted to get into this what what exactly what's on your heart about that yeah, I mean, the Tuka Rask situation, I'm pretty passionate about. I, I mean, I've been a semi Tuka Rask defender uh, going back to when I lived in New England. And uh, I still think, I mean, opting out of the bubble is uh, for your family is important. I, I don't fault him at all for that. But I think the, the greater thing that's happening uh, amongst Boston fans is there's always been kind of a, a pro and anti Tuka group in New England and, and amongst Bruins fans. And uh, I think a lot of that is why he's taking so much flack. He did apparently play golf right when he got back, so maybe that looks bad. You got to have a little more self awareness. But uh, it just in terms of like his his time coming into Boston, he he followed up Tim Thomas, and not just any Tim Thomas, 2011 Tim Thomas, which is a hard act to follow. I mean, <laughs> Tuca's uh, among Boston fans. Tuca's kind of his the ones who don't like him. The people don't like him charge that he's not good in big games but I mean Thomas was good in, in 2011 in every big game and you just don't like you don't see performances like that every year you don't see them every decade it, it rarely comes along I mean I, I think can think of J.S. Jaguar in 2003 with the Ducks and he, even he lost that series so it's like the, the final Stanley Cup against uh, against the Devils so I mean even if you play perfectly you can still lose. Tuca has played well in big games and uh, in the past. He just hasn't played well in every big game and Bruins fans just I think remember Tim Thomas and Tim Thomas's performance and think Tuca's just not not Tim Thomas and no goalie is Tim Thomas in 2011. Not and on top of that just his style. Tuca's a very positionally sound goaltender. It doesn't look like he's he's really trying. Thomas was always out of position diving for pucks and making saves but I think that is the combination of what's kind of of bringing up all this anti Tuca hate, especially from Boston fans. Um, there are still fans that defend him, but I don't know. I'm passionate about that. It bothers me when people get on Tuca's case, although the golf thing is a bad look. Well, yeah. talking about it, we have Joe Borg, who is like a f goaltender aficionado here, so he can go into a lot of that as well. He loves us like his favorite position in hockey. So, Joe, what do you what do you figure with Rask? He what left happened there? for his daughter, so you got to let him leave the bubble. I mean, it's ridiculous people that think he shouldn't have left. I think most people, I would say probably more than 9 out of 10 people, I'd probably, probably say 99.9% .9 of the time people when they get a call like that would probably leave in a situation. So, like, I think people that are saying they wouldn't just don't know and I don't know personally, and I'm saying this, and I don't have any kids, but I know in that situation I would 100% get out of a bubble and go home. I think people just never been put in those situations, and you never want them to be. But when you don't know what you're speaking about, it's a lot easier to go on Twitter and Facebook and say, oh, I believe this, I believe that. Well, that's because it's not you making the decision about your family, where I think that's what it is. He wanted to go home. Yeah, Goff's not the best look, but also – Goff is the most relaxing, let's get everything out of my head sport. If you know you're not good and you're just playing to relax when you have a bunch of stuff going on. So I will give him that. Like if you're someone that enjoys like the like meditation, like the relaxation vibes and all that, Goff is usually the sport that people do to get away from everything. Yeah. So I will give him that a little bit, but he has no, no it's perfectly fine leaving the bubble. And like Delhi said, no one's Tim Thomas during that stretch run and 
the Jekyll and Hyde, I guess, could be a way to say it, type of relationship he has with some Boston fans uh, where he's great and then others he's not so great. It, I don't understand it much. I've been in Boston a few times. I'm in a few uh, fan groups with the Red Sox being my second team and stuff with baseball and been up there a few times, but I never understood it. He's always been a good goalie. Uh, but again, it's always hard to follow a very high performing act. It's like following uh, Jeter in uh, in New York for the Yankees. It wasn't the easiest thing for a shortstop to do or following whoever, if Cal Pedersen's going to have that issue in L.A. following Jonathan Quick. So it's not it's not easy to follow any of these guys. And the people uh, sorry. started. Sorry to just jump in real quick again. The people who want to get rid of him, it's like, like if you're going to get rid of him, show me your plan to find someone who's better or just as good. Because, I mean, you guys being Philly fans, you know what happens when, I mean, there's their goal, good goalies don't grow on trees. Hopefully you guys have one in Carter Hart. But, like, I mean, if you get rid of Tuca without a, without a backup plan, a real backup plan, you could go 20 years having crappy goaltending. You, you got you to gotta take what you have. Exactly. Uh -huh. That's the urban myth. Uh, goalies, Pirlo and I, I know we talked about that, but goalies grow on trees is like a, <laughs> yeah, it's idea, like yeah. a myth. Uh, uh, goalies in general grow on yeah. trees. You Look how that worked out for Carolina. Yeah, you can get a goalie. The problem is how good they're going to be is different. You yeah. like If you pick a goalie in the sixth round and you're like, cool, this kid developed, we really like him. He's probably going to end up being a 1A, 1B type guy. I doubt most of the time the guy's not going to go from that to – Dominic Hoshik. Like, that doesn't happen. But, except for uh, Dominic so, Yeah, except for Dominic Hoshik. That's why <laughs> I use that. So, uh, like, there's not usually Dominic Hoshik's and Tom Brady's of the world in every, in every sport. That that just yeah. happens all the time. So, would you have Reyes, you should keep him, because I don't think Dan Vladar, who might end up being a backup in the NHL, I don't think they think he's going to be their starter. So, like Delhi said, what What's their uh, option baseline here? I think they have a kid overseas, but I don't believe they think he's going to be their starter either. So. I'll even go as far as to say that if Rask was in net, uh, they would have had an easier time with Carolina than they did. Halak put ha, let, let two goals in over his glove. That's been his weakness his whole career. So uh, it's been known about. I mean, Halak's a good goaltender, but, I mean, he's no Rask. And Ross, Ross did have a rough spell there for a little bit in his career, a year and a half or he was eh, like that. But for the most part, he's been absolutely fantastic. As far as going to see his family and stuff like that, whatever, I just don't believe a guy just said, oh, I want to use an excuse to go home here. I just, I just don't, I just don't believe it. And I uh, got to give somebody a benefit of the doubt. And as far as the golfing, absolutely. Lots of people do that. I like to play pool when I'm in a lot of stress. So I'll go to the pool hall or whatever the case may be, right? Golfing is one of those games that get away from it. Probably went with somebody who he could discuss this situation at home with or who knows. First of all, second of all, it's really none of our business. Uh, I just, you just, and not only that, the way Boston responded allows me to believe that they were playing for Rask. In fact, Hasek played one of the best games uh not Hashik, uh Halak Halaki, yes. played, played like Hashik that game. <laughs> but he, he played one of the best games I've ever I've seen him play for a long time after that. So they didn't want to lose for him. And they believe that he I believe that he was tortured by the fact that he had to go. I don't think it was any easy decision at all. So if you don't like Tuka Rask, then I don't know. Like I'm with you on that. Like uh, Askarov is coming up this year, and everybody's like, well, take him 15th. Okay, but whoever does probably is going to go. You're going to go back and say, how did he ever drop to 15? Yeah. I had one uh, more thing to say on that, though. I, one of the articles I read uh, last night before going to bed, I can't remember what NHL writer wrote it, but when he, he got to talk to Reyes and he commented on it being it was someone from Boston being on his family to him and that's how we found out it was about his daughter and they said that they don't know as of yet because you are allowed to come back into the bubble mm -hmm. so if they get deeper in the playoffs they said they don't know as of yet if he would debate coming back into the bubble so there is always it's not if he would or not but there is always that option still open yeah it sounds like he just needed he he needed to be there for support for whatever yeah. was going. So, okay, 
we got into that uh, cool topic, and, and I, we never did really venture too much into that. So let's look at uh, we'll look at the Vancouver St. Louis series. This has been to me the most. I, I said I think we said before we we thought this might be the most interesting series because of the two contrasting styles you have um, with uh, Peterson, uh, Besser, like sharpshooting, young, quick kids, and a much more veteran. Uh, kind of plugging, but you know they do have some speed on that team. But beat you down type defense, like St. or defense and forwards like St. Louis, and uh, then the uh, we can go back to a goaltending issue that seems to be happening there as well. So uh, we'll start off with uh, with Joe this time. What the heck? What do, what do, this? What what do you what do you see in this series that has put back given Vancouver? sort of an edge at right now do you think st louis can come back and uh, how am I, how have you been jo- enjoying it i thought it was a very good series i do think st louis uh for a lack of a better way of putting it gave vancouver that game yesterday i mean they had the game in their hands and then they kind of just didn't play good um where tyler mott's a good player and a good playoff player but he shouldn't be taking over the game like if if you if you label someone on Vancouver going into the game that's going to take over the game and probably be the potential top star against St. Louis in that game. It's probably not Tyler Mock going into the game who made a move around somebody on the PK to score. And then he scored on a break. Well, scoring on a breakaway is something he is adept to do because he flies. Uh, so if he can actually score on the breakaway and finish, he's a quick skater. So that's that's not uncommon for him. But making that move around somebody and making them look ridiculous, uh, that's not a good look on a for a, a defenseman or on a guy like uh, Mott, who I like as a third or fourth liner. But that's kind of like if Raffles coming up the ice and he nutmegs a defenseman and you're just like, oh, okay like like that's not something you really expect too much i do like how shen scored i've always liked him but i do think uh st louis kind of hung out jake allen to dry at times and i was watching their broadcast yesterday watching that game and they even talked about that where they kind of stunk yesterday in the end they left jt miller open uh like they just did not play good defense after going ahead there the one goal that was obviously jake allen's fault was on a return and when he uh Read the was assuming the pass is probably a better way to put it, and then Vertanen took advantage of that. But he's also a great player uh, that's great has great keen hockey senses. He's a guy that's been rumored if they ever get rid of him to a lot of teams because of how much the league just loves the way he plays. That's him showing off how his smarts there, being able to read that play and just shoot for that corner there and nail it. So I love what I've seen this series. Um, I do think St. Louis probably should actually be the team ahead three to two because you're the team that won last year. It has the experience and you let an inexperienced team come back, but that's on them. So good for Vancouver for being the inexperienced team that came back because of also what some people question coming into this series, depth scoring and depth scoring is the reason they won that game. So that's a very good sign for them as well. Yeah. What about you? Deli? I think, I mean, I think last night's game is going to be one of those games in a team's history that's like a coming out party for them. The Canucks, I think, I read an article too that, that had a similar idea where after they won their, their opening round series, they're like, all right, the rebuild's over. Now you're a competitive team. I think that's doubly true after last night. Yes, St. Louis played badly, definitely hung Allen out to dry. But one of the more important things of a competitive team that you see is taking advantage of mistakes. And Vancouver took out, took advantage of not only took advantage of every major mistake that St. Louis made, they also bounced back from some pretty devastating mistakes themselves to win a game. So, I mean, the Mott, the first Mott goal, he, he I mean, he's going against Petrangelo, but he takes advantage of a broken stick. That's just a fluke, but he 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 converts it. He scores a goal. I think that's the first goal of the game. But Still then, pretty play. <laughs> yeah, very pretty play. And then and then he kind of they showed. Uh, I think it was St. Louis's second goal where he gets a stick knocked out of his hands uh, by, I forget what player it was on St. Louis, and he's kind of throwing his hands up, complaining, looking at the ref. Uh, That's a pretty big mistake to make, and and to give up the lead and then go down uh, multiple goals after doing that, I mean, that could be a death blow for a young, inexperienced team. But I think Mott was a microcosm for his team in general, comes back, takes takes advantage of another mistake for the, I believe it was the game-winning goal shorthanded. So 
like Joe said, depth scoring is important, but I, I was most impressed by their, their stick to and their, their opportunism uh, to come back and win that game. Because even if St. Louis doesn't play well, they're the defending Stanley cup champions. They're a heavy team. They can hit. And don't forget that goal that uh, O'Reilly scored on Markstrom, I think to put him put St. Louis up by, was it, is that the two, two at the time? League? I think, yeah. yeah, that was a soft, just horrible goal on Markstrom's part. That, that also could have just devastated stated a young team but i think they showed a lot of uh, a lot of promise and i think i think they're now here they've announced that that they're contenders and maybe they might even still lose this series but uh uh going forward i think if if they can manage obviously their very very difficult salary cap situation you've heard you've heard rumors about besser being maybe being on the trade block and stuff like that that's a that's a tough pill to be dealt when you're just kind of becoming this team again that that's going to that could compete for a stanley cup maybe in the next few years but i don't know if they can find a way to to figure that out i I say look out for the canucks yeah i was going to say too uh, i think they picked up markstrom similarly to how boston picked up halak because they knew how good he did for them throughout the year and now so far throughout the uh postseason when he got subbed in and they know they've just been picking him up throughout the season where that's why demko uh, hasn't played as much as they probably would have liked because they haven't played as smoothly for whatever inexplicable reason in front of uh, him where Markstrom, it's good to see him other than that goal, which everybody has that happen every now and again. Um, it's good to see him have a good playoff so far because his is contract year. And I think as we're talking about them wanting to continue to be successful, they might want to keep him around because Demko looks like he's still a little raw to get full-time minutes yet. Yeah, yeah. they got Tim in uh, Luongo deal. When they traded yeah. Luongo to Florida, mm-hmm. they got Markstrom. That yeah. was, and in fact, that was one of the reasons why the deal took so long is because that's who they wanted back, and Florida didn't want to give him up. So that was a, it was a nice – ends up being a nice move. Another thing that happened in that deal was uh, that looked at the time like a, a – like a t- great deal for New Jersey was Schneider was traded for Bo Horvat, uh, ended up being Bo, Ho- Bo Horvat, the 10th overall pick. Uh, that was a little later, right? Yeah, that was after. Uh, blew, kind of threw everybody by surprise, but man, that kid is some kind of a leader. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, what's his upside? My gosh. Uh, I it, they're, The makeup of that team, you got Pedersen, who is probably in style wise the closest thing I've seen to Wayne Gretzky in some some time. I'm saying style wise. I'm not saying he's Wayne Gretzky, of course, but uh, he reminds me a lot of the moves he makes. His shot placement, except like uh, he's got a shot like almost Ovi off the opposite wing though, when the as well. Um, and Besser is a shooter like that. And Horvat, um, defensively speaking, talking about trading Besser, I just they'll find a way. Yeah, they get. I mean, maybe, maybe it's not re-signing Markstrom because it's you find that that's a hard that's a hard contract to sign if you're also trying to keep your your uh, up and coming forwards. But I mean, maybe it's it's just a it's a tough situation for the Canucks. I mean, I, I got a buddy who's a big Canucks fan, and he he's still cursing <laughs> uh, <laughs> ownership for some of the the old ownership or the old uh, the old uh, executive management. front office for uh, for signing some of those contracts. So. Yeah, tough. Uh, tough Erickson's situations. the one. To, I mean, elephant in the room contract that everybody knows, and he came out and says he has no intention of retiring because he has a lot more to give. I di- I didn't realize you were giving anything right now. <laughs> what are you talking yeah. about? Where yeah, yeah. Where's the more? Where have you been stashing it, dude? <laughs> he is. <laughs> he has been a member of some of the all time worst trades and signings in NHL history, including the Sagan trade with Boston, Boston to Dallas. I mean, yeah. I people were speaking of Boston. People were have been cursing him there for years, and when he finally is gone, people just celebrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they got they didn't get. Oh yeah, it's terrible. Just terrible trade. I think. Uh, if we go with other options, if they want to save money, since Demko, I said, doesn't look like you want to, you could give them one A, one B. You have Kadobin, you have uh, you have uh, Grice, you have others like that in this year's free agency that have been one A, one Bs. You can go with them and hope that uh, the platoon works to save you some money. That could be an option. It's going to be interesting when Vancouver gets 
eliminated or wins the cup or whatever. We'll get into that series that we're doing, which we're also going to do the Columbus Blue Jackets here coming up right away. It's going to be very interesting on teams exiting the playoffs and what they're going to do in the regular season. So the next thing we'd like to get into is the uh, a lot of things going on in the Philadelphia Montreal series. My gosh, what a back and forth that is. Uh, by the way, the Vancouver series, I predicted Vancouver to win that series. And in, and then I've gone back and forth in my head <laughs> several times, even. OK, I think it's St. Louis now. OK, I think it's Vancouver. Okay, it's, I, I'm terrible. I take I, I don't stick with my guns. Uh, but uh, Philadelphia, Montreal, we got two big happenings going on there. Um, there is a cross check to a jaw and a hit from behind. Um, well, I'm going to let, uh, since I, Joe, Joe is going to have the more emotional response here because we're both Philly fans. So I think, but, uh, I think Delhi will give us the more practical sense <laughs> from, from the more practical side of things. I know I'm pretty emotional about it and have a hard time putting it in my mind. Um, what do you think about the two incidents? Uh, what, uh, what, what would you say would be the right thing to do by the league? Should it, is it already been done? What do you figure? I didn't see any new news yet, and I was looking to see if there were any updates before um, on Niskanen. Or I don't think Kakaniem even has a hearing because there has been no update from player safety or anything on. Uh, looking at re-looking at um, that before we got on, uh, I kind of see um, he did have his turned like this while clearing the puck, but it looked like. That's also from the adjustment of if you're a right-hander clearing the puck, you can turn away as you're clearing in. If you're a lefty clearing, you kind of have to adjust this way to turn away from a hit. It's a little – being left-handed, it's kind of odd to adjust when clearing this way against the boards because you would be adjusting against the person's body. You would almost have to probably take a penalty yourself or do one of those things where you hit – back the person that they don't really like in today's game anymore either where like you turn around and they're coming at you so you just like screw you buddy and then you just lift your arms out and rock them so they don't rock you and then that's not going to be the best uh look either so i think that was just re-looking at it a shit situation for both of them because a left-hander you can't really it's hard to turn this way as you're clearing and all your momentum's going this way and for Kaka and Yemi, it's hard to let up. So re-looking at that, I think it was just kind of a crap situation for both of them from the angles both were coming in at, uh, re-looking at the play and that. Because everything in hockey, too, when you're hitting is about the angles you're coming in at and all that crap. And if you left your feet, like they said in the broadcast, and it didn't look like he did that at all. So I would say it's just bad placing, like how everybody was situated in that play. Where the Niskanen one is, I feel like he might have meant to do that, but who the hell knows? Um, because, like I said, Niski's tall, Gallagher's not. And I'm not insulting Brandon Gallagher. So he's a good hockey player, and I've always actually, other than this series, enjoyed watching him. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, but like when you're that short, if someone sticks right here, it's just going to default be in your snaz coming right here. So it's it's a thing that I think could by default get suspended for in today's game. But I do think if this was even five years ago, he might not have got suspended for it because it was even a little bit more lenient, even only five. Like, that's why, like, everything's changing so much in five-year spurts now in the game. Uh, but I'm fine for, I guess, if he gets suspended for it because it is something you shouldn't be doing. You have to make sure as a taller skater, you can adjust to a smaller skater. Um, so I see where they're coming from there. But it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. OK, before we go on, Dale, I'm going to tell the say the first instance for, in, incidents for the people listening. It was uh, Voracek cross-checking Gallagher in the jaw, breaking his jaw. And... Uh, then it was Kakaniemi uh, on a hit from behind with uh, for with on Sanheim uh, to uh, I think it was Niskanen, what, wasn't it? Wasn't Niski the one that cross? Niskanen, right? Yeah, Niskanen, yeah. sorry. Niskanen cross checking 
uh, Gallagher. Uh, so, Deli, what, what do you think about those two incidents? Uh, I think you got to look at the the kind of game, the game in general. Uh, Joe's point about size is 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 a good one. I mean, you see it happen with Char on occasion, uh, just being such a big guy and his stick being generally in there at that area. But you have to look at the events leading up to it. Gallagher, especially yesterday, was being such a professional pain in the ass that, like, I mean, it, people were remarking on it in the uh, in the broadcast. He was being he was just doing his job. He was being an agitator. But that was clearly, I mean, there was there was <laughs> bordering on some brawls going on in that game. So he was clearly upsetting some Flyers players. And I think if you look at that kind of background with what happened uh, with Niskanen, I, I mean, I think it was intentional. Um, I, I would support that uh, uh, that suspension. But then comparing that to the to the uh, Kakaniemi Sanheim incident with uh, Sanheim dumping the puck in and, and Kakaniemi kind of hitting him, not kind of, hitting him from behind. Uh, there's a little more kind of extenuating circumstances to that, too, in that Sanheim's dumping the puck, like you mentioned, Joe. He's doing it quickly. It's kind of a, it's just kind of a follow-through, like, on a shot that that he, I mean, I, he should probably saw Kakaniemi coming. Uh, I think the reverse hit maybe wasn't an option there because of the of the position he was in already, but yeah. you got to you gotta protect yourself a little more than that um and and just the speed at which at which kakaniemi well it's a hard thing to say over and over again um was coming in it's hard for him to adjust at the last second i mean you're not just gonna let up uh when it's a bang bang play like that so i think player safety and and uh um sorry i'm blanking on the <laughs> the ex-player who was who was the head of player safety even even though it's still shanahan no 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 no, oh, no no it's um he was a huge Peros. It was it's yeah, Peros. Peros, George. Oh, Peros. There, there you go. Yeah, I George think Peros, yeah. I think Peros. I mean, like a lot of the former player safety guys, ha- has a lot of experience in the situations like that in playoff hockey. So he gets a lot of he gets a lot of crap for his inconsistency and in decisions. But I think this one is going to be correct. I think if if they don't suspend Kakaniemi and they just leave it with the the five in a game that he got when he actually did it, uh, I w- I would think that's okay. Uh, you don't it's not a hit that you want to see in the game but it's it's also one that just kind of was the circumstances the, it was a perfect storm it just kind of happened uh, sort of watching it right now <laughs> watching it again right now before i say anything but um going I'll, I'll go by my initial reaction to when that happened um my initial reaction was a lot like yours is delhi but i also understand that joe is correct that he it's kind of hard He's he's a lefty and he's going to his backhand to dump it down, and now he has to come back. This way, yeah. Now he has to come back and uh, um, make it like protect himself that way. Um, Does does he even know he's coming? And you know what? I can make a case that he doesn't know he's coming here. So, looking at it, I don't think Kakaniemi meant to do that. Obviously, I don't think that's what he meant to do. But I also now looking at it, it's funny. I, when we first started this, I don't think Sanheim knew he was coming. So there wasn't much to protect himself with if he doesn't know that he's coming at all. But isn't that isn't that an indictment in and of itself that, I mean, you're an NHL player, you're in a vulnerable vulnerable position. You should at least have a little bit more of a, of a sense around you of, of what might be coming. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, it definitely would change the, he definitely could have changed the way he dumped that in somehow. Maybe he wasn't paying attention to the fact that somebody could hit him at that moment. Uh, it's, it's interesting for me. I don't think, and let me tell you this, I don't think very seldom, maybe 2% of the time that these incidents happen, I, do I think that the player actually meant to hurt the person at all. Very, very seldom. I played the game. I've hurt people. I have did things where if you looked at it on camera, you would say, well, are you obviously meant to do it. I can assure you I never did. I never meant to hurt the guy. It's just the game is so bloody fast, and you're working with so much emotion, and you're just trying to win the game. And sometimes we're so focused on winning the game that we kind of forget that we're humans out there. <laughs> and uh, that's what it just, it just happens. And afterwards, you shake your head and go, what the hell was I doing? Like... Uh, I've thought about it afterwards and wondered why did I do what I did. I, I remember I went from one end of the ice to the other and hit a guy from behind. And still to this day, I have no idea why I did it. It <laughs> was crazy. Crossed. Yeah, it was ridiculous. I deserved to get suspended, and I got suspended. Um, but yeah, 
I mean, how much did it prevent me from doing it again? I'm not sure, actually. I think the fact that I did it and remembering that I did it is what prevented me from doing it again. The suspension, not so much. There are guys that have been in the league that suspensions are necessary to get them to turn the, to do what they got. Uh, there are guys like that, but I think they're few and far between. So Yeah. Well, also, if you're no matter what sport you're playing, if it's hockey, basketball, soccer, football, whatever – if you're in a higher intensity game that game than usual, your emotions, sometimes you're, you have more split what they call like by the second thinking and reaction. So you're not really thinking of, oh, crap, well, the last time I hit somebody going like this, like with a check like this, they got injured. You're more, <laughs> OK, well, this dude just beat the living crap out of my teammate five minutes ago. And you're thinking by the game, by the second. And that, like you said, that makes you react at time where I think uh, that's probably why Niskanen will get a game. Because I think that thinking by the second reaction made him do what he did. Uh, so I, w- I would have to say uh, where the Kakaniemi hit was more, like I said, angles and just the angle. When I did relook at that, I could see what you're saying, because the way that uh, Sanheim turned. Uh, maybe uh, you wouldn't. It would cancel out your peripheral vision, mm-hmm. but you probably, uh, as Delhi said, and I'm sure AV and our coaching staff said that uh, when he was fine and came back in, make sure you keep your peripheral vision next time that you clear a puck into the zone. Um, so I think uh, that's just one of those plays that just happens. Is the best way to put it. Yeah, it's a weird play. I've been watching it over and over again. I'm sure they'll watch it over and over again as well. Anyways, boys and girls, this has been some fine programming right here. I've enjoyed it immensely. I hope you have as well. Um, we are uh, we're, we're going to go off with telling you where you can find these fine gentlemen. Um, I love all their work. In fact, I do a lot of work with them. So, Deli, where, where, where are you heading towards? I know you got maybe a po- uh, podcast coming up or something of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've recorded a couple episodes. We're going to wait to record a bunch, but it's going to be called The Lost Teams Podcast. Um, we're actually submitting it to a, a podcast contest, so hopefully hopefully that works out. But besides that, I'm, I'm uh, actually co-hosting Totally Offsides on Saturday, the Ducks podcast podcast. Uh, with a bunch of other wonderful co-hosts and uh i'm cooking up another hockey writers article that's coming out soon cool right on joe what about you buddy uh yeah you can find me at uh ot heroics pub sports radio and flyers uh nitty gritty and i know for delhi your delhi tweets on twitter right yeah yeah delhi tweets if you want to see some bad takes (laughs) (laughs) and then i'm uh at jj borick 26 on twitter with the youtube that Pierlo appears on it. Hopefully, Delhi will appear on sometime Sports Fanatic News. And you can find me on the Steel Flyers website, www.steelflyers. You can find all our my work on there. And uh, I highly recommend you go check it out anyways. It's a fantastic website. Uh, he's on, he steals on with us quite often, and uh, we're going to all be on together. I don't know what we're going to talk about next time, but I know it's going to be fantastic. That's our full 42, boys and girls. You go out and have a great time. Enjoy the hockey, as Joe would like to say, and uh, we'll talk to you later. <laughs>